morning, Shabbat Shalom, and welcome to United Israel World Union. This is our Sabbath morning scripture study coming to you live from St. Francisville, Louisiana. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are presently in a study on the Pentateuch, working through the annual cycle of readings uh, that are followed in most Jewish communities. And that puts us today, this class, is based on the final reading uh, in the annual Torah cycle of readings from the book of Genesis. We're in the final reading, Vayichi. We'll talk about that. Uh, but within the book of Genesis, we are also wrapping up number 10 of 10 books within the book. So we've talked about this every class. You've got this down, but I want you to make sure you understand that today we conclude the final part of uh, number 10 of 10. So number 10 book within the book was called, if you recall, Eli Toledot Yaakov. Uh, these are the bringings forth of Jacob. The focus primarily has been on Joseph, the favored son of the favored woman of Jacob. And this particular book runs from Genesis 37. Uh, it begins there. I just want to give you the framework one more time. Genesis chapter 37, if you'll go there with me. Talking about the book within the book, number 10, Ele Toledot Jacob. 37, verse 2, these are the generations of Jacob, or these are the bringings forth of Jacob. Joseph, notice it immediately tells us, that according to the scribe, that although this is a book with the title, these are the generations or these are the brings forth of Jacob, the focus is Joseph. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, etc. Now, if you'll go with me all the way to the end of the book of Bereshi, the end of the book of Genesis, Genesis 50 and verse 26. So Joseph died being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a box in Egypt. So the book brackets the story of Joseph, and that's why I call it the Joseph Saga, begins not at his birth, which occurred in the previous book, uh, but it begins when life really takes off for Jacob, the story that the ancient scribes want us to focus on. So there you have it. Uh, today we will conclude not only Ele Toledot uh, Yaakov, but we'll also conclude the book of Genesis. And with the close of the book of Genesis, we also close out the patriarchal period. And what I mean by that is, by the end of the book of Genesis, they're all dead. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, in fact, all the matriarchs, they're all dead. That's the way the story ends. But now while the book closes on such a note, uh, I want to bring up a point at this juncture that I think is important for us to understand. It has to do with life uh, according to the Bible. It's a biblical point, and I want to note that this particular portion, it kicks off. We're going to talk today about the death of not only of Jacob, but also of Joseph, and yet in a book that's filled with stories of death, it's called Vayhi, and he lived. And I think this is important for us to think about. The subject is Jacob, and it says, uh, our story begins today, uh, Vayhi Yaakov, and Jacob lived. And the reason I want to bring that up is because um, it, it's important to note the emphasis on life that the Hebrew Bible presents, and I'll touch on that just a little bit. Uh, the reading focuses, today's reading focuses on the end of the life of Jacob and on the blessings that he passes on to his sons. In one case, uh, grandsons, which are elevated, adopted, promoted, if you will, from the station of grandson to son. Now, you didn't know you could do that, did you? But you can. Uh, we learn that in the Bible today. The Bible is careful at least in most cases, to introduce us as we talk about death, most cases, it begins with the story of life. 
So you don't just report biblically and so and so died. It's an interesting nuance that I see in the text over and over, and I know you've noticed this as well. If you didn't notice it, uh, you will. Let me just give you a couple of examples. Uh, Look with me at Genesis chapter 47, Genesis chapter 47 and verse 28. Um, And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So the days of Jacob, the years of his life, were 147 years, and the time drew near that Israel must die. Notice it's slight. It's very subtle, but I want you to notice that it begins by recounting parts of life as we lead up to the notice of death. And and, uh, go with me to Genesis 5. Let me give you one section of text, which I think is pretty interesting in this regard. Uh, This in Genesis 5, scholars consider this to be a separate source, different, you know, than, than it seems like it's sort of out of place, but yet it seems to be ancient. This is like a list of life and death, if you look down. Uh, Notice at verse 6, well, let's look at verse 5, and all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. And Seth lived 105 years, begot Enosh. And Seth lived after he begot Enosh, 807 years, begot sons and daughters. And all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. You see, if you go through chapter 5, you'll see this time after time after time, generation after generation. Um, Look at a couple more. Genesis chapter 23. And I want to do this because I want to make a point with this. Genesis 23 Verse 1, uh, and these are the lives, plural, interesting, of Sarah, was 107 and 20 uh, years. These were the years of the life of Sarah, and Sarah died. Life, life, life. And then you have to report the death, okay? Now, there are uh, exceptions, of course, uh, but the focus on life rather than death in the Hebrew Bible, I think becomes obvious to the reader once you see it. And I think it should be duly noted. I think we ought to think like that. God forbid when we lose someone, death is the enemy, the Bible says. But I think that the focus, as much as it can be, ought to be on the life of that individual. They lived, and that's the story of of Jacob. And Jacob lived. He lived. Now, he describes his own life uh, in one way, but before I get to that, um, the other thing that I thought about as I prepared the notes and I'm reading all about the death and the end and all these people that were dying, you know, it made me also think about this, that according to the Hebrew Bible, although there's certain uh, opaqueness, it's, it's not crystal clear what happens to a person when they're no longer with us in the Hebrew Bible, but there, there are hints there are hints that this is not it. It's not, it's not all there is. You know, it doesn't go into a lot of description of the by and by, but for instance, uh, in uh, Exodus chapter 3 and verse 6, when Moses, we get into this next week, when Moses encounters God at Horeb, he's met by a voice that says, Anochi Ha'el, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. I am the God, Anochi Hael, I am the God. Not, I used to be the God of Abraham, I, they're dead. The point being that according to the Hebrew Bible, though it doesn't go into a lot of detail, it at least hints, it alludes that that is not all that there is, okay? Now you'll recall that Jacob himself described his own life, so go with me in chapter 47 of Genesis, Genesis 47, this was from last week's reading, uh, verse 7, Genesis 47, 7. And Joseph brought in Jacob his father and set him before Pharaoh, for Pharaoh, and Jacob blessed Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto Jacob, how many are the days of the years of your life? Because he sees this old man in front of him. And Jacob said unto Pharaoh, The days of the years of my pilgrimage are a hundred and thirty years. Few and evil 
have been the days of the lives of the the days of the years of my life, and they have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their sojournings. So he has sort of a negative assessment as he's 130 at the time. And he looks back, and we happen to have insight into some of his life, and he did have troubles. He sort of got a negative assessment, though, wouldn't you agree? Uh, they, they've been few and bad. 130, are you kidding me? He's had a lot of uh, interesting things happen in his life, hasn't he? Okay, now, this week's reading, the way that it kicks off, we are expected or we almost naturally think that Jacob and the family have been in the land of Egypt for 17 years, okay? So I want to look at this as my first question of the text. Remember, uh, today we're going to get into a lot of details about what does the Bible actually say, which we try to do every week. And then if you can stick with me through that tougher part, we're going to get into some prophetic things as well. But the first part of my class, I want to address this question. If, if you read the opening part, uh, you get the impression, as I said, that, that this story takes place 17 years after they arrive in Egypt. Let me just give you that. Genesis chapter 47, uh, verse 28. <clears throat> and Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So the days of Jacob, the years of his life, were 147 years. And the time drew near that Israel must die. And he called his son Joseph and said unto him, If I found favor in your sight, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and deal kindly and truly with me. Bury me not, I pray thee, in Egypt. But when I sleep with my fathers, you shall carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying place. And he said, I will do as you have said. And he said, Swear unto me. And he swear unto him, and Israel bowed himself upon the bed's head. So here we go. We assume again that it's been 17 years. We know he was 130 when he arrived. We know all sorts of interesting things. Joseph, the saga begins with Joseph being 17 years old. And now the author, in a beautiful way to tie things together, he wants you to notice, or she, could be a woman, we don't know. The author wants you to make that association. It's like the author says, hey, remember the 17 at the beginning of my story? Now there's a 17 at the close. All right? My question to you is, has it really been 17 years? All right. You'll know what I mean by that in a minute. Now, when Joseph, he makes Joseph swear, and one of the things that he says about Joseph, or he says uh, to Joseph, is I want you to do with me chesed vehement, uh, loving kindness and truth. And by that he means, don't you leave me in Egypt. By doing uh, loving kindness and truth, he's saying, swear to this, that you will bring me back to that land and bury me with my people. By the way, speaking of death, I love this idea that is presented, particularly in patriarchal text, that says, uh, and he breathed his last and was gathered to his people. I love that phrase. So uh, when I pass, hopefully when I'm 120 and I've been a burden long enough on my six children from moving from home to home with my, my bride by my side, we've already decided we're just going to work through them and just do that. Uh, I want somebody to say, and he breathed his last and was gathered to his people. Such a peaceful image, you know. So anyway, our story has two sets of blessings, if you will. They are represented as the final words of Jacob to his sons. Again, we assume that this is the end of the end of the end. You're wondering, why do I keep saying that? Stay with me. So the first set of blessings, the first sons that he meets with to pass on these final words are the sons of Joseph. And this is dealt with in chapter 48. 
Uh, and I'm going to describe to you the, the scene. We'll look at it in just a moment. But uh, Jacob here, I mean, uh, Joseph hears that his father is ill. Someone comes to him and says, hey, your, your dad's not doing well. So he gets his boys. Now, I want you to imagine, how old are they? All right. You're thinking, are they little bitty boys? Are they at least older than 17? I mean, what, what's going on here? It's kind of hard to tell at this moment, but this is something we have to unpack. You know, inquiring minds want to know. So when he gets the boys, Joseph and the boys are there. I want you to look with me at chapter 48, uh, verse 3. And Jacob said unto Joseph, El Shaddai appeared unto me at, in Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me and said to me, Behold, I will make thee fruitful and multiply thee, and I will make of thee a company of peoples and will give this land to your seed after thee for an everlasting possession. El Shaddai appeared to me in the land of Luz, in the land of Canaan, and blessed me and said, I will make thee fruitful. Go with me to Genesis 35. Genesis 35 and verse 9. Uh, Vayera Elohim and Elohim appeared unto Jacob when he came from Padanaram and blessed him. And Elohim said unto him, Your name is Yaakov. Your name shall not be called any more Yaakov, but Israel shall be your name. And he called his name Israel. And Elohim said unto him, I am El Shaddai. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. And the land which I gave unto Abraham and Isaac, to thee I will give it, and to thy seed after thee will I give the land. And Elohim went up from him in the place where he spoke with him. Now I just wanted to bring that up because Jacob heard from God at Luz in the land of Canaan, be fruitful and multiply. When he tells Joseph that God El Shaddai had appeared to him, he remembers it a little bit differently. Now, scholars get into why this is, but today I'm going to keep it straight by the text and we'll just talk about it. God said, you be fruitful and multiply. Jacob says that God told him, I will make you fruitful and multiply. It's a subtle difference. But does that mean, these are the kind of questions we should ask of the text. Do we then look at this and see that Jacob must be thinking, God has to do this for me. And so he then attributes that the, the, uh, the part about making fruitful and multiplying to God as opposed to something in his own doing. Now, by the way, Genesis 35 verses 9 through 12 is one ancient source's recollection of the naming of Israel. And another from a separate source is in Genesis chapter 32 verses 28 and 29. You'll recall that Jacob is on the way back from Padan Aram and, and he meets um, there at the Yavok, and he has the wrestling match. You remember that whole story? Well, that appears to be a separate source telling the same story. The main details are exact. He's on his way from Padan Aram in both uh, chapter 35 as well as chapter 32. He encounters uh, one who changes his name. Details are a little bit different. But nonetheless, we know uh, that the story is basically um, uh, the same. Now, I want to make another point about Genesis 48, uh, and if you'll go back there with me, Genesis 48, verse 3 and 4. <clears throat> Actually, I want to make a couple of points, and the first is that this particular passage in 48 appears to me, my assessment for what that's worth, is that this text uh, has not been updated. Now, what do I mean by that? Notice it's very clear there's, there's no updating of names and places. So if this had been updated by a later scribe, it would have most likely said, and Jehovah appeared to him at Bethel. 
You see, you understand? But here it says El Shaddai appeared at Luz. Now, the reason that I bring that up is because these ancient names for God, for Elohim, you have the being, Elohim, and Elohim identifies himself as El Shaddai in the most early sources, or the earliest sources, I should say. And, and then the place is called Luz. So in the patriarchal period, there was no Betel uh, it, until a later point. So like when Abraham went there in Genesis chapter 12 and 13, and it describes it, it says, went to Betel, that is Luz, or Luz, that is Betel. There are these uh, episodes where later writers update the text to reflect the contemporary time in which they're writing. Let me give you a, a, an example. Look with me at Genesis 28, uh, Genesis 28 and verse 19. <clears throat> and he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at the first. Well, see, that's an intrusion into the text. It's, it doesn't take anything away from the inspiration. It doesn't do any of that. It's just simply an editorial update. And we can be thankful for these editorial updates, but there are a lot of them. So when we're looking for and trying to trace the earliest strata of the text, the most ancient form, we have to look for clues that indicate that it's been updated or edited. And a lot of people get nervous about that. Take a deep breath and say, I'm not nervous about that. It's clear as a bell. Whenever we see these things, we just need to make note of them. Okay, one more. Look at chapter 35, verse 6, Genesis 35 uh, and verse 6. <clears throat> so Jacob came to Luz, which is in the land of Canaan, the same as Bethel, he and all the people that were with him. You see that intrusion? All right, so what I want you to imagine and what I want you to understand is that I'm, I'm a scribe, and I have inherited all of these ancient stories which I want to preserve. Perhaps God has spoken to me about preserving these stories, and I begin to assemble these ancient stories. Here's one, Scribe Ross. Here's another. Here. Now, your task is to put these together. And this ancient scribe, the compiler, the editor, or you could use plural forms, when they began to assemble these texts, they wanted you to understand that Betel was not called Betel at the first. It was called Luz. Now, next week, we're going to really get into this issue about the name because some, um, as you'll see, some still think that they can go on believing that the name Yehovah was known in the earliest times, but we'll get into that. We're talking about texts which have been updated. Now in 48, chapter 48 of Genesis, what we have is uh, Jacob is going to bless first the sons of Joseph, and he tells Joseph he's going to make them like Reuven and Simeon. The first thing I thought when I read that in Hebrew as I worked through the text, I thought, don't, don't do me any favors. Don't make me like Reuben and Simeon. Remember, they're both outcast in the family. But what he means by that, obviously, from a careful reading of the text is, he's saying you're going to be elevated into the station of sons, just like my boys that I had with Leah, Rachel, Bilhah, and Zilpah, these boys, Manasseh and Ephraim, they're going to be on the same level as the sons. Now, part of that, people talk about this in these academic articles and in commentaries. You know, the question is, uh, is it in some way to give them that status, you know, because their mother was an Egyptian woman and, you know, who knows? There's no indication here that that is looked on in a negative way at all. Uh, Judah has, uh, has his share of uh, time with the girl from, you know, the other side of the neighborhood, and, uh, and so does Joseph, right? So it's not really a big deal. It's not the big deal that's later made of it in tight religious circles. These people fell in love just like we do. 
uh, and religious stricture has come in and sort of don't marry. If you're a Baptist, by God, marry a Baptist. You know, that's the, that's the way we think. But in the ancient world, that, that wasn't really what we find. So, uh, but, but like Reuben and Simeon, what Jacob, Yaakov, Israel is telling Joseph is I'm going to take your two boys, uh, Manasseh and Ephraim, and they're going to be to me. They're going to be called by my name. They're going to be tribal leaders, basically. Now, if you look with me in Genesis 48, <clears throat> Genesis 48, and let's look at, um, let's just read that, verse 6, and now, uh, verse 5, and now your two sons, Genesis 48, 5, who were born unto you in the land of Egypt before I came unto you into Egypt are mine. Okay, point of reference. The boys were born to Yosef and Asnat uh, prior to Jacob coming to Israel. You got that? So in other words, he's 130 when he gets there. He dies at 147. The boys are born before he's 130. All right? So when, when Jacob dies, the boys are at least 17 years old. Now, some of you might think, who cares? Well, you're going to care. All right? Um, <clears throat> Ephraim and Manasseh, even as Reuben and Simeon, shall be mine. <clears throat> and your issue that you beget after them, kids that you have in the future, they'll be yours. They shall be called after the name of their brethren in their inheritance. And as for me, when I came from Padan, Rachel died by me in the land of Canaan in the way when there was still some distance to come into a fraught. And I buried her there in a way to a fraught. The same is Beit Lechem. The same is Beit Lechem. What does that sound like to you? A scribe's updated that text. Okay? No problem. I just want you to see it. He, if he's telling the story, when Jacob is telling the story originally, before this was edited, he would have simply said, and when there was still some distance to come to a fraught, and I buried her, there in the way to a fraud. Makes perfect sense. The later editor had to say, that is Beit Lechem. You see that? Now, um, some scholars believe that this particular text, the edit begins, and I have to share this with you because I think it's fascinating. They propose... The, the top scholars in the field of Hebraic, Hebrew Bible studies propose that a certain section is edited and inserted into this story. It too is an ancient story, but it's not part of the original account. And here's what they say is inserted. Um, look at uh, verse 1 of Genesis 48. And it came to pass, after these things, that one said to Joseph, Behold, your father is sick, and he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Go down to verse 8. And Israel beheld Joseph's sons and said, Mi Eli, Mi Eli, who are these? Right? It's, they tell Joseph, Joseph, your father is ill, and here he comes with his two boys. Jacob looks up and says, who are these? Now the text, the story reads perfectly fine, in that fashion. I'm not suggesting that the academics are right on this, but stick with me. Now the question becomes, <clears throat> it's important to remember that Jacob has been in Egypt more than 17 years, uh, or right at 17 years at the time of his death. Now my question to you is, this chronologically, in its placement in the text, the story, when Jacob says, Mi Eli, who are these? Does has it been 17 years and he hasn't known Joseph's boys? All right. I, I want you to be puzzled for just a moment. I want everybody going, I don't know. Verse 8 and 9. 
Who are these? And Joseph said unto his father, They are my sons whom God has given me here. And he said, Bring them, I pray thee, unto me, and I'll bless them. Now, it could be <clears throat> that he has met them, and at 147, he's slipping. Right? That's one option. Could very well be. I do that now. I don't ask who my grandkids are, but, you know, I might when I'm 147. That could be one. And I'm doing this because I want to make a point. Uh, because remember, in chapter 47, verse 28, it said, you know, he was there 17 years and lived to be 147. Now look at verse 10 and 11. Genesis 48, 10 and 11. Now the eyes of Israel were dim for age, so he could not see. And he brought them near unto him, and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said unto Joseph, I had not thought to see your face, and lo, God has let me see your seed as well. Now that sounds like something that Jacob would say as soon as he met the boys. You know? Now, you, you, one might say, well, he's, he can't see, so he just kind of, he looks and maybe he can barely make out Joseph and two others, you know, and who are these? Maybe he doesn't recognize them. And, he, you know, and then when Joseph said, these are my two boys, you know, he go, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, of course. But this comes to me, it strikes me as something which is very uh, fresh, like, this is something he saw or would say as soon as he met him when he first got there. Are we to assume that these boys are 17 or older in this text? All right, let's keep reading. Verse 12, And Joseph brought them out from between his knees, and he bowed himself his face to the earth. Now, I don't want to do this, but I could have John and Lyndon come up. They're adult-sized people and say, you know, and they could like, kind of like be right here, and I could usher them forward. Is that what the picture is, or is it children coming from between his knees? You try to put your 17 between your knees, it'd be a little awkward at a family meeting with Pawpaw. I'm telling you, this image that I get is that this is going back to that first meeting. Now there's a blessing that comes for these boys as well. We'll get to that. Now look at uh, Genesis 47 again, Genesis 47 and verse 28. And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years, so the days of Jacob, the years of his life, were 140 and 7 years. Now, I want you to, I want you to think about this now. <clears throat> the writer of this, compiler, editor, scribe, is giving an overview, right, of what is to follow because he mentions that he lives to be 147, but we now are going to go back in time and look at an event that took place earlier. We know Jacob is 130 when he arrives in Egypt and that he dies at 147, uh, 17 years total. Clearly, verse 28 is out of place chronologically. It means that we have a look forward at this point. The scribe wants us to say, He's going to make it 17 years. It's sort of an overview. It's like a heading of an ancient source story. The author is giving us an overview of what is coming in the story. It's sort of a summary like this. Jacob is in Egypt 17 years. I'm narrating this. I'm, I'm going to write. I have a source. I have an ancient source that's come to me. And it, it, all it tells is about how Jacob brought his boys to meet daddy to get the blessing. And I'm going to tell that story. I want that in my holy book here, but I have to tell you what it's about. So I'm going to give you a, a heading. Uh, Jacob is in Egypt for 17 years. He dies at 147. He makes Joseph swear to him not to bury him in Egypt. Israel bows his head. I'm just taking notes because I need you, the reader, to know this. These things will happen in the narrative which follows. And then he starts the story. 
Now look at verse 27 of 47. Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the land of Goshen, and they uh, get them uh, possessions therein and were fruitful and multiplied exceedingly. Now look at uh, chapter 48, verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that one said to Joseph, Behold, your father is sick. You, you see, the, the narrative flow is Israel goes to Egypt, he's fruitful, he multiplies, and then, you know, a short time later, after he's arrived in Egypt, uh, he's told your father is sick. There's no need to assume that 17 years have passed. The phrase, after these things, in Hebrew, that phrase occurs 12 times in the Tanakh. Uh, half of these, six of them, are in the book of Genesis. The scribes in Genesis, uh, the author of Genesis, uses this phrase frequently. It, it's, it's a nonspecific time frame. After these things, right? Just because the scribe doesn't have the data, most likely, to say. When the scribe does have data, he says, and Joseph was in prison for two years. Well, he knew that. Or it had been seven years Jacob worked for this woman and seven more years. When the data is there, it's recorded. When it's not, the scribe has a tendency to be sort of vague. And after these things, I don't know when it was, but I know orderly, this happened after he got to Egypt, right? Very clear. A nonspecific time frame. Do we use that in our day? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know what you say when you read a story to a child? Once upon a time. Well, it's not specific, but it's, you know... It, it implies that it's some unknown, unspecified time. The question I have is how soon after Israel and the family arrived did these events take place? You ready? Get your pens. We don't know. We don't know. But the stories are presented as sequential. Israel arrives with the family and a 17-year clock begins to tick. Here's what we know. From the time he gets there at 1.30, he's got 17 years. And the scribe wants us to note Joseph was 17 when he and his father were separated. He's got 17 years with him at the beginning of his life and 17 years at the end of his father's life. His first 17 years and his father's last. It's artistry. It's beauty. It's, uh, it's this way to, to frame an ancient story, and I think it's quite lovely. We know that the family is settled in, um, in Goshen. <clears throat> sometime later, sometime later, Joseph is told that his father is ill. How much later? We just don't know. Israel, uh, he brings his two boys, Manasseh and Ephraim, to his father. Uh, at this point, I think it's pretty soon after he arrives. And Israel blesses, adopts, elevates them to the status of sons, just like Reuben and Simeon. Now, more on the blessings uh, of B'nai Yosef shortly. Now, I want you to go with me to 4821. Remember, I told you that the first part of my class, I'm looking at textual things and then we're going to tie some, a pretty bow on it with some nice prophecies. How's that sound for a morning menu? Uh, Genesis 48, 21. And Israel said unto Joseph, Behold, I die, but God will be with you. Okay? Elohim imachim. But God will be with you and bring you again unto the land of your fathers, Moreover, I have given to thee one portion above thy brethren, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and with my bow. A couple of things I want to ask you. Now, 21, Israel said unto Joseph, Behold, I die, but God will be with you. That's plural. Imakim. 
Now, the English translations don't do justice to the Hebrew because you assume it says, Israel said unto Joseph, Behold, I die, but God will be with you. You think he's saying, Joseph, God's going to be with you. But it's plural. Elohim imachim, cause you to return. That's plural. Right? Now look at the next one. To the land of your fathers. That's plural. So why is Jacob addressing Joseph in the plural? Now a lot of people might say, oh, well, that's because he's got the boys with him. He's talking to all of them. Uh, okay. Now just put a note there. Put a little tick mark on your notepad. Now then in verse 22, it switches back to the singular. Moreover, I have given to thee. To you, lecha, um, I've given to you one shoulder, is what it literally says. Now, what does that mean? I've given to you one shoulder more, basically. Uh, it, it's probably a play, a very subtle, interesting play that slipped in because the, the name, he's talking in context about Shechem, Shechem. The place, Shechem. In this place, Shechem means shoulder. So he's giving Joseph this area, this particular place. Now, is it plural when it's plural because the audience here is Joseph and his two sons? It could be like this. He's looking. you got Joseph, Manasseh, and Ephraim there together. And he says, he looks at Joseph. To you, when he wants to talk to all of them, he does like this, like I'm doing right now. Or I could look at a specific person, or like you who are listening to me today. It could be something like that, the reason you switch back and forth. But what I'm really interested in in this particular text is a question about what is being talked about here where it says... Uh, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and with my bow. Okay. Anybody remember Jacob taking him from an Amorite with sword and bow? Do we have that story? Well, uh, could he be talking about the slaughter by Simeon and Levi? You know, because in a way, Shechem was taken by violence, according to our account in Genesis uh, 34, verse 25 through 29. In fact, it even mentions sword. It doesn't mention bow, but, you know, it, we're talking at, at this time, early bronze or earlier, you know, they would have used uh, uh, swords and bows and that kind of thing. We know that. The sword is mentioned, uh, but... Jacob seems to say that he, well, it doesn't seem, Jacob says, I took Shechem with my sword and my bow. And you might say, well, it's just, you're being too strict on it, Ross. It means that his family took Shechem by force, and that could be. Okay, I'll give you that. But he's very critical of the taking of Shechem by sword and bow, uh, very critical uh, he says that Simeon and Levi are instruments of cruelty. He doesn't want anything to do with their crime. So why would he now assume responsibility in his statement to Joseph? Very interesting. All right. In fact, in uh, Genesis 49, which is part of our uh, reading today in verse 7, uh, look at verse 5. We'll actually read 5 through 7. S this is his... This is his blessing, if you will, or his final words concerning Simeon and Levi. Our brethren, Simeon and Levi, our brethren, weapons of violence are their swords. O oh, my soul, come not thou into their counsel, unto their assembly, my glory be not thou united. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they hocked an ox. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. See, we try to make excuses for biblical characters all the time. You know, like, you know what their answer was? Jo Jacob is sickened 
when he hears what they did to the people of, of Shechem. He's sickened. He says, you have ruined it for us here, boys. And by the way, they have to leave after that. Don't, don't make excuses for this, please. So Jacob, basically, he's sickened by this. And you know what their answer is? Should, they, should we let them treat our daughter like a whore? You know, just like, what should we do? Well, not that. You slew everyone. You took their children and their women. Killed the animals, the people. So that, I just want you to get, this is horrible. And it goes in Jacob's mind, he still, he says, look, this is your final, my final word to you is you're going to be scattered in Israel. Now, the writer wants us to feel that. The writer doesn't want us to take their side in this, you know, and say, well, you know, I mean, justice is justice. That's not what the writer wants us to see. The writer wants to see this is an overreaction, putting it mildly. And, and let me ask you this. If this is in reference to that event, the slaughter at Shechem, is, uh, is there ever a mention of a Amorite? Do we know that the people of Shechem are Amorites? These are questions just to make you think. Now, the reason I bring it up is because we need to know these Amorites, and we are going to get into the Amorites. We're going to study a lot about Amorites, and what does that mean? What is that people group, or is it a specific people group, or is it a name which has another meaning, which is sort of broadly uh, meant to point to the people of Canaan? All right? Keep that in mind. Hold that in your notes, just right. Ross is going to talk more about Amorites later. Now, um, here's what we do know about Shechem. Uh, we do know that it ultimately does go to the tribe of Joseph. The people of Joseph do ultimately inherit Shechem. In fact, uh, when Joseph is buried, look with me at Joshua 24, uh, verse 32. This is almost the end of Joshua. And the bones of Yosef, which the children of Israel brought up out of Egypt, buried they in Shechem, in the parcel of ground which Jacob bought of the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of money, and they became the inheritance of the children of Joseph. In particular, they became the inheritance of Manasseh. For now, just keep a marker on the, the idea of Amorites. We'll come back to that. Okay, still with me. Chapter 49 of Genesis, like 48, is presented as Israel's final words to his sons. More to the point, as prediction, almost prophecy, if you will. How do I know that? Go to Genesis 49, and uh, let's look at Genesis 49, verses 1 and 2. And it says, And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the latter days. Assemble yourselves and hear, you sons of Jacob. Hearken unto Israel your father. Now imagine, he calls them into the room and he gives them this idea um, that he, he's going to tell them something about the end. Now before I get into that, just like in Genesis 47, 29, when Joseph is told that your father is near death, he's ill, um, this is a similar thing. It, it, and I believe that they, they happen some pretty close together. It would make sense to me. Um, one might rightly assume that both of these events, the blessing of Joseph, uh, the sons of Joseph, and the blessing of all the boys together, that these events come together at a certain time. Now, he says, gather and assemble. Uh, both of these are in the plural. Gather ye, or y'all gather, y'all assemble. And I'll tell you, plural, about that which shall befall you, the acharit hayamim, in the latter days. In the latter days. Now, that, that particular phrase is prophetic in and of itself. You know, it could be taken 
You could say it might mean in days which follow, but that's what, that's what we mean by that. When we talk about the latter days, biblically, they're the days which follow these days. You, we think, here's the, the, let me get you this straight. That didn't even make sense in English. Let me help you get this straight. If I'm talking about the future, we tend to think that's looking forward, right? We, a forward-looking visionary person sees the future. In Hebrew thought, we don't say it like that. It's subtle. But you think about it as the days which follow. They're coming up behind you. They're, gonna, they're right behind you. Tomorrow is not that way. In Hebrew thought, tomorrow is behind me, right? So he, when in the Bible, when it says the latter days, those which follow, akarita yamim, that phrase is used 13, uh, 13 times in the Tanakh, and it points to what follows. You got that? All right. The verbs here are very interesting, um, and I want to focus just on that for a moment. Gather and assemble. He's going to talk about the Akarit Hayamim. Go with me to chapter 11 of Isaiah. Isaiah 11. How do you go to Isaiah 11 from the story of Joseph? Here we go. Isaiah 11, 11. And it shall come to pass in that day, declares... Uh, in that day that the Lord will set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people that shall remain from Assyria, from Egypt, from Patros, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamat, and from the islands of the sea. And he will set up an ensign for the nations and will assemble the outcast of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. The envy also of Ephraim shall depart, and they that vex Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, Judah shall not vex Ephraim, and they shall fly down upon the shoulder of the Philistines on the west. Together that uh, shall they despoil the children of the east. They shall put forth their hand upon Edom and Moab, the children of Ammon shall obey them. And Jehovah will utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea. With his scorching wind will he wave his hand over the river, will smite it into seven streams and cause men to march over dry shod. There shall be a highway for the remnant of his people that shall remain from Assyria like as there was for Israel in the day that he came up out of the land of Egypt. Everyone say, Hallelujah. Now, this particular passage is interesting because of its connection to the story that we're reading in the patriarchal narratives, particularly we talk about Judah and Joseph. This text, this prophetic text, is filled with clues, allusions that point to this great redemption that's coming, and it ties in with our patriarchal narratives. For instance, uh, in verse 11... Let me see where it's at in the Hebrew, uh, and it will come to, pla uh, come to pass uh, where it talks about uh, in that day that Adonai will reach his hand, extend his hand a second time. In Hebrew, it's Yosef. Yosef means to do again. Remember when Joseph is born, she names him Yose Yosef because God has given her another, an additional son. So this text is doing a play on the word Joseph. Why? Because we're going to talk about reaching again the second time and bringing back Joseph and Judah. That's what this is about. Now, it's talking about the return of scattered Israel. Now, in verse 12, it says, um, He will set up an ensign, and notice where it says, will assemble the outcast of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah. That's our two words that Joseph, uh, Jacob uses in his blessing to the tribes. Gather yourselves together, assemble and listen. Gather and assemble together in a text. Look, this is where else I found it. Isaiah 11. Gather 
and assemble. Same Hebrew words as we find in Genesis 49, clearly seeming to look forward to a um, prophetic picture. Now, um, so we have two groups that are talked about in Isaiah 11. The banished of Israel, group number one, if you're taking notes right, number one, banished of Israel. Number two, the scattered of Judah. Two groups. They both have to be brought back. Verse 13, uh, there's two, there are two parts to this prophecy, and most don't get this. In fact, I've not read this interpreted this way. They miss this because they're not careful with the text. What we have in verse 13 is what's called Hebrew parallelism, meaning you have two uh, parts to this prophecy prophetic utterance, and part A has to align with part B. Now, you, you're going to have to think about this as I do it, so I don't want to gloss, I don't want your eyes rolling back. Think about this with me. Part A has to equal part B, and this is how I understand it. Part 1, A, the jealousy of Ephraim shall depart. The jealousy of Ephraim shall depart. Now, we'll understand this better in a minute. Now, it says the harassers of Judah shall be cut off. So you get the impression that Ephraim is not going to be jealous anymore, and whoever it is that's harassing Judah is going to be cut off. So part two has to say the same thing. You ready? Ephraim shall not be jealous of Judah, and Judah shall not harass Ephraim. Wait a minute. Think about this. Here's, here are the equal parts. I probably should use a dry erase board, but you can do this. Draw a line down the middle. On the left-hand side, I want you to have 1A equals the jealousy of Ephraim shall depart, and the, the component which matches that says Ephraim shall not be jealous of Judah. So there is a jealousy in part one that says uh, jealousy of Ephraim will depart, and then part two qualifies that and tells us that Ephraim's jealousy that's going to depart is that Ephraim will not be jealous of Judah anymore. Meaning that at the present, Ephraim is jealous of Judah. Twice in this verse, worded slightly differently, God says through the prophet Isaiah, that's not going to be the case. Now, part two, the harassers of Judah will be cut off. You get the impression that somebody is picking on Judah. Somebody is harassing Judah, and they're going to be cut off. Ah, but the second part clarifies that that is not what that's saying. Not in this prophecy. It says, Judah shall not harass Ephraim. The harassers of Judah are not an outside group harassing Judah in this picture. The harassers of Judah are people from Judah who are harassing Ephraim. You see what I'm saying? So it's not someone harassing Judah, it is a group within Judah who are harassing Ephraim, and that group will be cut off. These are key points. Do not miss this. It's called Hebrew parallelism. Part A, one has to meet part 2A. Part 1B has to match 2B. Now, I'll work with John uh, uh, John Perry Baruch, and I'll send him a little diagram, and maybe he can put that in the notes so it makes a little more sense. I just don't want to drag the erase board and all that right now. This prophecy means that when the restoration takes place, Ephraim will not be jealous of Judah. That jealousy will be gone, and Judah will not harass Ephraim that harassing one, that harassing group within Judah will be cut off. Now, how many of you thought that the harassing ones uh, were a group outside of Judah harassing people of Judah? I know I did for a long time. So these stories 
at the end of Genesis, of Jacob's final words to his sons and grandsons, suggests that they are, there are prophetic hints within them, and I'm going to cover a few of them. So, for instance, in uh, chapter 48, we're dealing with the sons of Joseph. Genesis 48 is dealing with the sons of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh. Remember that Ephraim ultimately, historically, if you follow this through, you'll see that Ephraim becomes the dominant tribe in the northern kingdom, uh, so much so that Ephraim becomes the name associated with that northern kingdom. Israel, Ephraim, Joseph, you know, all those... uh, Names are attributed to the northern kingdom. Ephraim, we read in Jeremiah, is God's son, his firstborn son. Ephraim, Ephraim, Ephraim. Um, All of Joseph, all of the sons first. Look with me at Genesis 48, 15. I'm just going to hit a few of these high points. 48, 15. And he blessed Joseph... And said, the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God who's fed me all my life long unto this day, the angel or the malach who's redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads and let my name be named on them in the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. Now, We're not going to get into this at this point, but he's asking that the angel bless the lads. Interesting. All right? But that is a whole class in and of itself. He says that part of this blessing is that the name name of his uh, fathers is going to be attributed to this group. Now, where it says, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. That's, I need to tell you about that. Some of you know this, but the word there, to grow into a multitude, they're trying to figure out how to give you in English what it says in Hebrew because the root word of the increase there is the Hebrew word dog, and dog means fish. Now, how do you say Uh, and they will grow into, they will, like, some people try to, because it's something that fish do. You ever see uh, fish that are swimming together, you know, on a video or something, and they're all, the idea is that they're proliferate. Some say, let, they try to translate the idea, let them proliferate like fish. The idea is that you want them, they're going to come together like fish, see, and they're going to be together somehow, we don't know how. But it doesn't mean let them grow into a multitude. They don't know how to say this in English. It has something to do with fish, though. Now, go with me to Jeremiah 16. I'm going to show you what Jeremiah thought it meant. Jeremiah 16, uh, verse 14. Uh, Therefore, behold, days come, saith Jehovah, that it shall no more be said, as Jehovah lives that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. What? Something's coming that's so great that people will not even say Jehovah lives that brought the children of Israel up out of the land of Egypt. That's a pretty big deal, right? Here's what they're going to say. But as Jehovah lives that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the countries whither he had driven them, and I will bring them again into their land that I gave unto their fathers. Behold, I will send for many fishers, saith Jehovah, and they shall fish them up. If this group, Joseph's descendants, are to become like fish, then the way you get them is you fish for them. If I were to begin a prophetic ministry to attempt to start the clock, if God spoke to me and said, go get those people, I would kick it off like this. I would say, I'm a fisher of men and women. Or I might even say to others, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. That is the most brilliant way, the most biblical way to kick off a movement to bring back the scattered ones. 
They're going to be like fish. They're going to be among the nations. Then you need to get your pole or get your net. You're going to need to go fishing for people. Someone once said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And I know within this group, we have people from various faith backgrounds. And some uh, have discounted the whole thing, uh, everything that they grew up with. But that, ladies and gentlemen, is a powerful, powerful prophetic way to kick off the redemption. And if I get called to do that, I will say the same. Now, Joseph notices that the boys, that daddy's got his hands swapped uh, on different, on the boys, right? He's got Manasseh and Ephraim. Uh, Joseph brings them to him where the right hand will be on the eldest and, and daddy has swapped his arm. Joseph tries to correct it. And go with me to Genesis 48, 19. Genesis 48, 19. Uh, and his father refused and says, I know it, my son, I know it. He also will become a people. He also shall be great. Howbeit, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. Could be translated, a fullness of Gentiles. The idea is that this Josephite, this descendant of Joseph, his descendants will also become a great people. His seed will become a multitude of nations or a fullness of Gentiles. We're talking about a Josephite. Interesting, right? God's redemption in its totality, uh, the plan will not be realized until this Melo Hagoyim, fullness of the nations, is in. Until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in, as someone once put it, another brilliant point, uh, then, then this is not, we're not going to realize the full. Uh, fulfillment of God's plan and purposes on the planet. Now back to Genesis 49, gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you, ba'akarit hayamim in the latter days, assemble, plural, and listen, plural. Both of these seem to be hinting at an order that's going to trigger the redemption. Come together first. Listen, you know, and, and I think in ways that's what we have to begin to do is to assemble ourselves together and then, shma, listen. You know, Moses speaks of the latter days. Go with me to Deuteronomy 4, Deuteronomy 4, verse 30. When you are in tribulation, Deuteronomy 4 verse 30, when you're in tribulation and all these things are come upon you, ba'akarit hayamim, in the latter days, you shall return to Jehovah your God and hearken to His voice. For Jehovah your God is a merciful God. He will not fail thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of your fathers which He swear unto thee. Akarit hayamim, Deuteronomy 31, look at 31 verse 29. This also is part of the latter days. He tells the children of Israel, verse 29 31, of 31, For I know that after my death, you, plural, will utterly corrupt yourselves, turn aside from the way which I have commanded you, and evil will befall you, ba'akarit hayamim, in the latter days. Because you, plural, will do that which is evil in the sight of Jehovah, to provoke him to anger through the work of your hands. And they'll be scattered. Latter days. Look at Isaiah 2. Isaiah 2, verse 2. And it will come to pass, Bakarit Hayamim, in the latter days, 
that the mountain of Jehovah's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. Look, listen, Isaiah's looking. He's getting a vision. He sees someone coming. He's at a restored, restored Jerusalem. He looks out. He sees, he calls them nations. All nations are flowing to it. Go to Jerusalem now. You see it every day. People, red and yellow, black and white, people of every race, ethnic, you know, it's all just, so this is what he sees. Now, who are they? He says other Gentiles. Egoim. Calls them Goim. Um, let's see. Let me find, okay. And all nations shall flow to it. All nations shall flow to it. Uh, and many peoples, verse 3, uh, Amim, many peoples, he's just looking, shall go and say, come ye, plural, let us go up to the mountain of Jehovah, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of his ways. We will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall go forth Torah, the word of Jehovah from Jerusalem, and he will judge between nations and decide concerning many people. Okay, now if you look at this particular phrase, this passage almost is word for word in Micah 4. Except where one sees Gentiles, the other just says, uh, let's just call it people. One uses goyim, one uses amim. And I find that fascinating. Your homework this week is look at the chapter uh, 2 of Isaiah prophecy compared with Micah 4 prophecy and look at those together and see why does one say people, one say Gentiles? Because one looks out and he sees they, they don't look like Israelites, so they must be, they're just Gentiles. They're every color, race, they're, you know. And then the other one is like, I'm not so sure. I'm just going to call them people. It is people because it's the returning people who were supposed to return, but that's for another class too. Uh, are they Gentiles or what? All right, a couple more passages. Look with me at Jeremiah 23, Jeremiah 23, verse 20. The anger of Jehovah shall not return until he has executed, until he has performed the intents of his heart. In the latter days, Ba'akarit Hayamim, you shall understand it perfectly. That same phrase is used in Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 24. In the latter days, you'll understand it. The reason I think that some of this is only now being understood is because we might be in a period known as Barakarit Hayamim. Doesn't mean we have only a week or so left. Who knows? But the, the clock is started. Sequentially, things are beginning to happen. People are beginning to wake up. Ezekiel has a vision, a valley of dry bones. Ezekiel 37, verse 1 through 14. And in that vision, Ezekiel is asked by Jehovah, what do you see? You see these bones? Can they live? And Ezekiel says, you know they can live. You, you know. And he says, speak. Remember this? And, and so when he begins to speak, let's look at that. Let me go there right now. It's not something in my notes, but it is now in my notes. Ezekiel 37. Uh, verse 1, the hand of Jehovah was upon me, brought me out in the spirit of Jehovah, set me down in the midst of a valley, and it was full of bones. And he caused me to pass by them round about, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and they were very, very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I said, O Lord Jehovah, you know. Again he said unto me, Prophesy over these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of Jehovah. Thus saith Lord Jehovah unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live, and I will lay sinews upon you, and bring up flesh upon you, cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live you shall know that I am Jehovah. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, an earthquake, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And behold, I beheld, and lo, there were sinews upon them, and flesh came up, and skin covered them all, but there was no breath in them. 
And then he said to me, prophesy unto the Spirit, prophesy, son of man, and say to the Spirit, thus saith Lord Jehovah, come from the four winds, O, o Spirit, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. And he said, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried up. And our hope is lost. We are clean cut off. Therefore, prophesy, say unto them, Thus saith the Lord Jehovah, Behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am Jehovah when I've opened your graves, caused you to come up out of your graves, O my people, and I will put my spirit in you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land, and you shall know that I, Jehovah, have spoken it and performed it. Gather yourselves together, gather yourselves together, assemble yourselves, and let me tell you what has to happen. That is going to be first, because the first thing that has to happen is you have to hear the word of Jehovah. Hearing the word of Jehovah brings the bones together. You might not like to be called bones, but the bones come together first but not until the word of Jehovah goes forth. When I say word of Jehovah, I'm talking scriptural, what God said, not what a man said about what God said. We're talking about this has to be something that can raise the dead. A message from Jehovah for the latter days that can raise the dead. But they come together first. They're still dry bones but they're together. And you have to recognize that that stage that you've just got an assembled graveyard. And then the message has to be, Spirit, breathe upon these slain ones that they might live. And that's what happens. Everything which follows in 49, Genesis 49. Our time doesn't allow us to go through each of the prophecies, but a few quick, quick points. Judah and Joseph are addressed directly, and all others except Reuven are spoken about. All right, and you can look at that closely. Like he says, Judah, this and he says, Joseph, he speaks directly to Joseph. But when he's speaking about the final words to the other tribes, it's all third, like they're not in the room. Simeon and Levi are instruments of cruelty. You'd imagine they would go, we're right here, Dad. But it's spoken in a different voice. Joseph and Judah are the focus. I want Our author of Genesis really wants us to think about this as we move out of the book. What has happened at the end is something we need to carry with us into Exodus. Judah and Joseph, and by the way, the rest of the Bible, Judah and Joseph have moved up. Judah and Joseph, because of their common love for the Father, have come together in a very interesting relationship. And that relationship pictures a prophetic relationship as well. But they are the key. Remember, 1 Chronicles 5, verses 1 and 2 mentions Reuben, uh, you know, that he did this bad thing. And now Judah, here's Judah's role. And by the way, and Joseph gets the birthright. So we get that in 1 Chronicles 5. This, the plan of Jehovah, El Shaddai, the Elohim to the fathers, will be acted out over the course of biblical history, this plan. And it's still being worked in our day. But for now, Yosef, the beloved son of the favored wife, is dead in a box in Egypt. And in a way, so it is to this day. Joseph is in a grave. But 
The promise is that when the word of Jehovah goes forth, the bones will come together. And when the Spirit comes upon these bones, they'll stand up. The family of Israel needs at this point in the text to go home to the promised land. And so it is even in our day. The family of Israel needs to go home to their own land. And next week, we begin that journey as we start the book of Exodus as our continuing Focus on the Pentateuch picks up again in a new book. Don't miss it. Shabbat Shalom. Shavua Tov. See you next week.